two minutes early, guys. Aren't you so happy with us? I'm not happy with me. I'm so I'm so tired. <clears throat> I feel great. I don't care about how you feel. Like, I've been waking up at, like, no earlier than 7.30. It feels good to wake up on time again. I've been waking up no later than 5. <clears throat> no later than 5? Yes. You fool! I feel like a fool for working in general. Uh, let me pop this out. Pop out, chat. Hey, it's been popped out. <clears throat> okay. So welcome. Hi, things. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Not hi, things. Oh, but yeah. Hi, um, uh, you said the next time we start, we're going to have an intro. All right. We're the Super Whiskey Bros. Penis. We're the Super Whiskey Bros. Penis? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we two combined are the penis. Are the penis. Our powers combined <laughs> are a penis. <clears throat> Anyways. Anyways. Um, will you hand me those pipers? Yeah. Are we doing pipes today? <clears throat> yes. Exciting. Well, I don't have any stickers, so if you didn't... I, well, I was going to bring one <clears throat> and I forgot <clears throat> to. So if, if, if you brought no stickers, there are no stickers. Well, I like pipes anyways. I mean, I like both, but we're just going to start right off with this part. Yeah, well, fortunately, I've already packed them. You have already packed them. What a guy. What are mm -hmm. what are we smoking? Uh, this is one of my own blends. Oh. <clears throat> are you not allowed to say on camera what it was blended with? You're like, oh. you can tell us what you have to kill us? I mean, I'll tell you what it was blended with. Uh, it was... Love and care? Kindness? <clears throat> it was three parts uh, burly. Three parts Virginia, one part Latakia, and one part Oriental. Mm. <clears throat> I wanted to make it very burly heavy because I wanted to be a nice kick in the teeth. And I have a lighter, but you just, why not use matches if you have them, right? Mm-hmm. For a pipe, yes. Set that there. Tyler, would you grab my ash tray back there behind you? Oh, yes. It's awful loose there on the top. I'm going to repack it. Yep, it'll do that because it, it kind of expands when you um, uh, just don't tamp it too hard. Anyways, hi guys. Hello. We are talking amongst ourselves. We're trying to light pipes. <clears throat> yes, because everyone... Why do you keep switching to Top Shot? I want you to be in a live chat, you idiot. Thanks again, YouTube. You useless douche. YouTube as an entity is a useless douche. Ladies, imagine using a douche and then it was useless. That's YouTube. So you mean a literal useless douche? I do. That's what you did. You didn't is. toast that very much, did you? Not very well. <clears throat> and then, yeah, this is my own mix here. Fair bit of bite there. Mm -hmm. That's just from it being too hot. It shouldn't, be, it, it in and of itself isn't very bitey, being in English. It wasn't the heat. The first, the first bit was a real bite. Mm. No, I meant from you got the tobacco too hot. You uh, I, I, the first bit is almost always bitey. I thought you literally meant <clears throat> no, no, not fire in my face. <clears throat> yeah, not you were pulling in too much heat. You you were making the tobacco a bit too hot, and I. It's not the worst thing you've accused me of. But it's at the top five. Pipes are not exciting on live streams. Yes, that's true. Okay, so now. Um, uh, so, oh yeah, usually we put in the brand of the, um, uh, of the tobacco or the whatever that we're using. Um, I, we can't do that because, um, uh, uh, yeah, we can't do that because, um, uh, uh. Legal reasons. Uh, because I made this myself. There's no brand. That's what it is. And there is a brand of the supplier. I don't know who the supplier was. Although, we can't talk about these pipes, though. Both of these pipes are McQueen pipes. And um, uh, the one that he's smoking was purchased from 
a supplier of McQueen pipes. I can't think of their name. The people at the Renaissance mm. Festival. Um, I don't remember either. I bought a, f- a fair number of items for them as well. You guys know who you are. You're great. You really are great. They would make some fantastic cigars, too. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Okay. So, I'm, uh, uh, I'm going to tell you guys... I didn't tell him what this is. And now I'm going to tell you guys what this is at the same time. This is... I know it's is... alcoholic. So, we're still in... Oh, why did I not change that to week three? You did earlier. When you reset it, you forgot to do it again. Week three. Now save. There we go. Um, uh, so this is uh, Aberfeldy week three. And so this is going to be Aberfeldy. This is uh, an invention that I made. <clears throat> so it's, as you can see from it being in an old-fashioned glass, it's an old-fashioned. <clears throat> But my, I make my old fashions a little bit differently than most people. Instead of using like four drops of, or four dashes of Angostura bitters. New fashions, if you will. So instead of using four dashes of Angostura bitters, I use two dashes of Angostura bitters and three dashes of orange bitters. Mm. And oftentimes people will muddle an orange into an old fashioned. Uh, my using the orange bitters is kind of a substitute for that because I don't have any oranges. I just muddle oranges for fun nights on a Tuesday. <laughs> I muddle more oranges by 10 a.m. than most people do by noon. <laughs> <laughs> by 10 a.m. I hated that. Thank you. Um, uh, but I just but. stoked this real fast. Dude, I'm stoked to watch you stoke this. You're just going to have to relight it. It's okay. Yeah, it's too far gone. So, um, uh, I'm bad at, I'm, I'm really bad at keeping pipes lit. Honestly. Ow! See that piece that's missing? Is it on your finger? It was on my finger. Oh. Ow! So, considering we're smoking pipes, it does seem super appropriate with our topic today. Yes, it does. <clears throat> oh, I, I, let me finish talking about the, the drink real fast. This oh, is good Aberfeldy. lord! Um, uh, I just interrupted myself. Oh, well done. Um, uh, so an old-fashioned would normally be uh, one half ounce of simple syrup, uh, four dashes of Angostura bitters, and two ounces of either rye or bourbon. Okay. <clears throat> um, uh... And I do have some bourbon, but it's actually, it's bourbon, but it's very spicy, like you'd expect a rye to be. And so what this is, is I this substituted is- one of those ounces of bourbon. So I, uh, I told you how I do, th- how, the, how I do that differently. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how I do the, the bitters differently. I substituted the half ounce of simple syrup and one of those ounces of bourbon for an ounce and a half of Aberfeldy. Sure. The Aberfeldy is so sweet that it can replace the sugar, and it actually turns it into a sweeter drink than what it was before. Okay, I believe you. I haven't had some yet. I'm game. So, because of what I keep around my house, and since we haven't been able to do this for a little while now, this is the first time in three weeks that I've had any sort of whiskey at all. Okay, so I'm going to say this. I must have put sugar in it last time, because it's not as sweet as I remember it being, but it's still very good. It's still very good. Mm -hmm. Whiskey always makes me make that face. Just ignore me. It's really good. Mm. So really drink. what this is then is it's just um, uh, two types of whiskey and bitters. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean... Fantastic! <laughs> <clears throat> Couldn't have planned it better. Okay, but we have pipes today. Uh, just at random, really. Sometimes we do pipes, sometimes we do cigars, but... Turn our mic down about half a degree. Half a degree or half of a... Spec dot. I don't know. Boop. A spec dot. Okay. And that looks better. Yeah, that was We're not good. peaking, so it's good. Mm-hmm. Um, today, we're going to um, uh, dive into literature a little bit, actually. We don't want every single <coughs> episode to be just about video games as much as we love video games. Mm-hmm. We do know things about other things. Not a lot. Not a lot of things. And we don't have very good opinions, but we can talk about them. So... Since we have pipes, what, what, how do we want to ab- approach the subject here? Because I think the, if you're talking about, we wanted to talk about our favorite stuff. Because that's, mm-hmm. what, I, that's what this whole channel's been about, is things that we like and that we both enjoy. Mm-hmm. So if we're talking about literature, we probably would be completely remiss if we didn't say that we're probably going to talk about nothing but like different forms of um, fantasy fiction novels. <clears throat> yeah, pretty much. In, the, um, in, uh... in, very, in many, many different forms, but still. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, probably, let's see, we, he and I do have some 
uh, a few authors that not are from everyone, but between the two of us are unique to one or the other. Like, I read, I love Brent Weeks, and I don't think he's read anything by him. Definitely not. Um, uh, and a few other things like that. Um, uh, uh, but pretty much, like, there's the, 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 there's a standard that that we all go by. Um, uh, uh, like, in anything fantasy that we read, unless it's just not comparable at all, we will compare to J.R. Tolkien. Mm-hmm. That's he's he's tops for us. Um, uh, this is true. <clears throat> we think that Mr. Clive Staples Lewis is fairly good. Um, uh, <clears throat> it's true. I do in fact think that. Why is this thing keep freaking going now? See, Ooh. I packed this one heavy for you because I know that was the that's how you like to smoke. <laughs> and and then, I don't smoke that way, and it's screwing me up. And now you have this pipe. <clears throat> yeah. This was awful loose. I was going to say something about that, but that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Ton of sense. So, I think, when we were going over what we wanted to talk about, and we said we want to talk about literature, it, you don't just want to say, let's talk about our book. So, I don't. I mean, this isn't book club. We're not going to talk about anything that's been written in the past, like, a couple years. So, it would be related as a book club. <clears throat> yeah, but uh, we do we do want to talk about things <coughs> maybe that that made the things that were special to us special. Mm-hmm. Um, what maybe set them apart from from everything else that would have been around the same time, or why we didn't read certain things, or why we may have started something and not finished it and gone back and read uh, Lord of the Rings again. Mm-hmm. Oh, you, you know what? I don't know what. <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> the um, uh, the, the there's one person. That you and I both enjoy thoroughly. That is usually not fantasy. I can think of one book that's historical fantasy. Most of his books are just, even even for his era, they were historical fiction, and uh, we that's not something. Uh, this we'd be remiss if we didn't at least at some point. Nah, we can't just because of what we're talking <laughs> about. Yes, because we're talk we talk about what makes a good mythos and stuff, and there's not really any mythos to this guy. You can say his but, name at this but, point. But we would be remiss if we didn't both at least say, I love Robert Louis Stevenson. I love Robert Louis Stevenson. <clears throat> I do. What a guy. What a very alive man. <laughs> yeah, he's <laughs> definitely hasn't perished a hundred years ago or more. <laughs> Possibly more. Um, we do love Robert Louis Stevenson, but mm-hmm. um, the, the thing that we're wanting to dive into today is what kind of separates... Whenever you're writing a book that's fiction, obviously that just, it can be really anything. But when you're writing a book that's fantasy fiction, Mm -hmm. you kind of have to, you have to create something. Even if you just borrow it from a bunch of other people, you still end up making it your own. And there's just so many different people that have done it so many different ways. Some of it is garbage. Mm -hmm. And some of it's just like, you know, again, we're talking about J.R.R. Tolkien is, is like the pinnacle for that type of topic. So, for instance, if you're talking about like high fantasy, which is what you consider like elves, dragons, mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff, um, I don't think anyone would say there's someone more adept than their J.R.R. Tolkien. He's kind of the sta- He is the standard. I would say... Like, but why is he the standard? Lord of the Rings is, is the perfect example of fantasy just because like... <clears throat> It's exactly on the borderline between high and low fantasy. Mm. <clears throat> it's like, sometimes, like, this is definitely high fantasy. Other, other times it's just like, yeah, not everyone's human, but this is pretty much a low fantasy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's well, that's a, a thing I liked about Game of Thrones. It was way more low fantasy than high fantasy. Mm-hmm. But when they dropped high fantasy in, it was like, oh, yeah, I forgot. There's magic and dragons. Uh-huh. Like, they did that really, really well, I think. <clears throat> um, they, he, whatever. Mm-hmm. But he, not they. They, Apparently. They, for the most part, they did okay. <laughs> Overall, a B, B minus. Um, oh, but, speaking of he, he uh, this is off topic for a second, but yes, you seen it? Oh, okay. <laughs> it's only like what twenty seconds long, and I've watched Vadi's like fifteen minute video about the twenty seconds. <laughs> <laughs> of course, he did that. <laughs> um, we're talking about uh, it's called Elden Ring. Is that what Elden it's Ring. Uh-huh. So. Our absolute video game hero, <clears throat> Miyazaki Hidetaka, is teaming up with George R. R. Martin to make a video game. Not and Miyazaki we're... Hayao. He's a false Miyazaki. <laughs> a false one. It's not my Miyazaki. It's a false one. Do you know who Miyazaki Hayao is? No. He's the guy that started uh, Studio Ghibli. 
my other favorite Japanese person. <laughs> Hello, sir, who's not watching this show. You're great. <laughs> um, but! Um, oh, that derailed me aggressively. Oh, well, let's just get on the topic then. It, what, when, you're, when you write something that's high fantasy in particular, not that we have to just talk about high fantasy, but when you write something that's high fantasy in particular, <coughs> let, let's define that term real quick. High fantasy would be if you're writing a work of fiction, but like there's lots of non-human, non-normal, non-earthly elements. Yeah. You so, can just throw a book back 500 years with swords and spears and call it high fantasy. That's low fantasy. Yeah. So like um, uh, anything that doesn't happen... Or in our world is fantasy, mm -hmm. or anything that changes how our world works is fantasy. Yes. Um. Uh, so, whereas fiction could be written inside of our own realm, inside of our own time, mm -hmm. and use our own histories. But when you start meddling with that, it becomes low fantasy. Mm -hmm. If you're meddling with it lightly, if you're meddling with it, um, and so now, like, so anything that takes place on another world is fantasy, unless it's you know a book about the moon landing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it, uh, anything that takes place in another universe, I'll put it that way. Is is a um, uh, fantasy? Well, since the moon landing <clears throat> happened in a studio in California, clearly that's not the same. <clears throat> Obviously, um, uh, it's it's gonna be fantasy. Um, uh, if you have like lots of things that are impossible in our world, magic dragons, um, uh, which you know both of those are debatable. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, but things that are considered to be impossible in our world. Then the once you start introducing a lot of that, then you're getting to high fantasy. Yeah. Like you can have like other races in a low fantasy, but just you know leave out like, with basic. It's pretty much magic, really. Pretty much magic it is, is what makes high fantasy. fantasy. <laughs> magic or magical creatures. Mm -hmm. Well, just magic. That's a good differentiation. I think. Um, so I don't want to jump too far onto a bunch of nonsense here that you that to explain too much. But um, are you familiar with Joseph Campbell at all? Um, it's not that's fine. It's kind of yeah, it's cool. like, not not a name I recognize. It's not obscure, but it's obscure in this day and age. So Joseph Campbell was a psychology professor at one university I don't remember, but he wrote um uh, the Hero with a Thousand Faces, which is essentially the concept of the hero's journey. Mm, okay. Um. So Joseph Campbell would essentially argue that all the different phases of the hero's journey can can occur. <clears throat> completely inside of our own world and our own natural stuff of just going to the grocery store you could encounter the entire hero's journey. And it's a, a, a super interesting read if you guys like like psych, psych sort of readings that just are just really insightful to how different cultures work and how our culture works with storytelling. It's really great. Here with a Thousand Faces is one of the best books of all time. Just read it. But it, there's something about, <clears throat> about creating an actual whole world for your story or hero's journey to take place in that seems to be attractive to everyone. And the real thing, the main thing that we wanted to, we had to give a big introduction to get to what we're talking about, but the main thing that we wanted to bring up and talk about was what makes a really good mythos? What makes, what makes a world believable and useful and makes you want to be immersive in it? So, for instance, you're, you're um, uh, people who write books and the entire purpose of the book is like to introduce you to this other world almost mm -hmm. always suck. Almost always. You have to find a seamless way mm -hmm. to have the world exist and then you write your really good story inside of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's <clears throat> that, that, that's a big thing. I would say, for me, like um, uh, the most important thing for a good mythos is um, uh, uh, is because because this is not what makes a good story. What makes a good mythos mm -hmm. is consistency. Yes, <clears throat> because. Like, if you're sitting there and you say, okay, like, you have, the, you, you define at the beginning of your book, you're talking about how your world works. Oh, well, I mean, you know, a, go, a good author probably won't do that at the beginning of the book. They'll introduce how their world works as things go on. But then, you know, like, they introduce magic, and they start kind of defining the rules for magic. Magic is, is one of the biggest ones that... Uh, that it becomes inconsistent in a lot of mm. books. And it's it's very about. easy to get off track with that. Very easy. You say, uh, you think you say, magic does this and this and this. And then later on, you say, oh, oh, oh it, 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 all, it also does this because I need it to do that right now. And they're like, wait a minute. No, that's not, that wasn't defined. Like, that's, you know, it, that goes beyond the rules of magic that you set out before. And that, it, that, that doesn't ruin a good book, but. It kind of breaks you out of it for a second. It makes it makes you not feel as immersed if something's just going to constantly change whenever the heck you want to be changed. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's different than when you're using it as a story element to find out that, oh, this can be done because of this. We've discovered new things. 
then it'd be, it'd be different if you did that as opposed to like someone sh- a different match you showing up and be like everything is different. That would be yeah. the really unimmersive. <clears throat> Let's see. A you know I have I don't really can't think of right off the top of my head a bad example of magic. Um, uh, I can. <clears throat> not not right off the top of my head. A good example of of I mean a bad example of the rules of magic being changed is what I mean. Um, uh, a really good example of the rules of magic being changed. Um, uh, two the two best examples is um, uh, uh, Aslan referencing the deeper magic that the witch didn't know about mm-hmm. is a good example. Another really good example is um, uh, learning the name of the language mm-hmm. in, in at the end of the right. Inheritance so cycle. using it as a plot twist is great if you can do it the right way. Mm-hmm. But like Sean just said, so in in the Chronicles of Narnia. <coughs> And specifically in the line of the witch in the wardrobe, mm-hmm. um, the entire, <sighs> the core of what's happening inside of that world, not the story, which is why C.S. Lewis is a genius, because like mm-hmm. you can make the plot thicken and not have anything to do with your main characters, really have them be almost narrators and figures experiencing it. And that'd be the main focal point of the story, as opposed to like focusing on the development of the character. Because shockingly, there's not a lot of character development mm-hmm. in Carlton Arnie's stories. But they still manage you to get really attached to the characters. Like, you'll have moments of character development, but you don't feel a progression. You're like, ha! Ah! Like, the only good character of an example would be Eustace, and that's literally it. Yeah. Yeah, but. <clears throat> oh, I say that. There, there, is, there, there is character development with Edmund. Edmund gets somebody, I mean, like, it's almost so sharp. Mm-hmm. Like, it just happens. <clears throat> Different person. Cool. Awesome. Go on yeah. and continue being cool. And then for the rest of time, he's great. That's annoying. Uh, kind of, but that, that, that does make, kind of make sense with his character just because, like, Edmund wasn't a bad guy. He was just a bad kid. And he, fi- like, he figured out really quick, these people want to kill me. The people I was mean to are the people that like But me. that's the thing. <clears throat> that's the problem. As soon as that happens, for the rest of the book series, he's a rock star. Mm-hmm. That's annoying. <clears throat> And, yeah. like, Lucy being, like, a, a, this awesome, amazing, like, innocent hero. Like, she's, what, 12, 11, younger? She Probably. sucks. I, I don't all, think it's defined. All kids suck. Mm-hmm. Show that a little bit. But anyways, the, what, ma- <laughs> what, what makes that story so important is that there's a core element happening. Essentially, spoiler alert, mm-hmm. <laughs> the witch is trying to kill Aslan. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she keeps referencing the deep magic about saying if this happens then this will happen then this must happen and I demand this and then Aslan is like ah what no one knew is that there's a deeper magic than the magic that was deep in the first place <laughs> as it turns out you are the one that is surrounded <laughs> and poof here I am so mm-hmm. it, it, it technically if you read that on paper you're like that's annoying as balls mm-hmm. it looks so stupid on paper but if you're a really good writer mm-hmm. And if you're being an, having an aggressive allegory in this mm-hmm. case, a really aggressive allegory in this particular case, then you can get away with it if you're really, really good. And that's, I think, what we want to talk about. That You can make the changes to the mythos. You can define your mythos. You can have everything in your mythos. And as long as you're really good at defining it and really good at writing around it, you've mm-hmm. created a great mythos. So, for instance, a hard left here from Cross of Narnia into what is borderline low fantasy... Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it gets very high fantasy in your hurry, but uh, Lovecraft is pretty low fantasy for the most part, and it has mm-hmm. random moments of high fantasy. Yeah. So Lovecraft is another benchmark for creating a mythos. Which, by the way, that aggressive allegory is, um, uh, I mean, is, I would say, is... Really? You know how aggressive I smoke. And you, I grabbed the one that you packed lighter. Uh, still, it's, that should have been at least a 20-minute smoke. Uh, it's 23 minutes. Okay, yeah, never mind. You're good. <laughs> My apologies. Um, uh... Well, since you're done grabbing my lighter, I will stop wasting matches relighting this thing that I packed for you. Where is it? It's right there on the oh, the right there where I can take everything off. Yep. And get there. But I my pants. Um. Uh, are you gonna be able to reach it? I might be able to spread this I out some. I got it. I'm good. I'm good. I don't need that. Okay. <laughs> um. Uh, but that aggressive allegory is the reason why I believe. Um. Uh, that Edmund's transformation was the way it was because of what they're getting at. They're saying, hey, like, you know, Jesus died, and now you're on, and now he died for you, and you know it, and now you're on his side, and you're pretty much going to stay on his side. And I'm not saying do. I don't like that. I'm not uh-huh. saying I don't like that at all. But what I'm mm-hmm. saying is from a writer's standpoint, yeah. that's annoying. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, like That was just for the allegory, I think, and I'm... Uh, 
I'm all, I, I lied. I got a little tiny bit left in there. Please continue. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Who is at the bottom? Ooh. Um, sorry. Um, but essentially, when you have, we'll dive back into the, the HP Lovecraft statement I was trying to make there. I actually hate dumping out the ash, but I need to. I don't care. I love it. H.P. Lovecraft does this thing where everything inside of... He, he managed to make a mythos that I think is a little more special than most people's because <coughs> he encouraged people to play off of it. That's mm -hmm. dangerous. But it worked really, really well for him and his legacy, which he had done until... I mean, obviously a legacy is long after you die, but he had <coughs> nothing until he died mm -hmm. because of his mythos. <coughs> yeah, I mean... When, I mean, so he was writing in the teens and 20s, right? Teens and 20s. And it didn't really start becoming popular until about 30 years ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, he died well, borderline penniless. Like, he was selling stories for, like, $12 mm -hmm. to Weird Science or whatever that magazine was called in a uh, R.I. Mm -hmm. but, um, but, yeah, he, he was an unrecognized <laughs> genius. No, oh, no, good lord. But anyways, we're getting way off track with all this stuff. I mean, I love getting off track, don't get me wrong, but I'll at least to finish defining our statement. So for us, if you... if For us to really want to be interested in a book that you're writing and to want to read what you have going on... Excuse me. If you're writing a high fantasy thing and your entire point of your book is to describe this magical world... And that's great. Don't get me wrong. That's great. I, I love that that's a thing that you're doing. Keep doing that thing. But, <clears throat> if you're writing a story, you have to find ways to establish that mythos continually throughout it. You can't take an entire book and be like, we're going to talk about this thing. That's, you, can't, you can't do that and not make it drag. Because no one wants to read that. Everyone wants to discover it. They want to see it. They want to find out what's happening. And that works really well. Again, like, go back to Chronicles of Narnia. Everything that you see with it, you don't really learn about everything that's happening in Chronicles of Narnia until you read the whole thing. Mm -hmm. You have to read the whole thing to understand everything. And that's important because if they would have described everything in detail from the beginning, that would no one would have finished that first book. No one would have cared. Yeah. <clears throat> which, which was interesting because I don't know how much he was planning on writing when he wrote The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Mm. And it's cool that he set it up that way, just because, like, everything that he wrote, a lot of it seemed like an afterthought. Like, especially, like, um, uh, like The Magician's Nephew was the next-to-last book he wrote. And he, like, he, like it was a, an afterthought, and it tied everything together so well. Well, I like that. You know, I'll, I'll defend that <clears throat> aggressively, because mm -hmm. <clears throat> Christopher Paolini did something similar to that. He wrote, um, or helped publish, I don't know that he necessarily wrote this, Mm -hmm. A book that's essentially just, um, I don't remember what it's called now, but it essentially gives you the gist on a lot of the things in Allegasia, um, like the races. Even though he does a decent job of defining them throughout, mm -hmm. there's a book that essentially just goes through and describes everything. Now, it wasn't a novel. It didn't go in with the inheritance cycle, but he did do it, and that's important. Um, uh, C.S. Lewis just did the better thing, because he's... Mm -hmm. Better, sorry. Um, and and he, okay. he had a whole book. He, he actually wrote a story that brought you to the end to, to bring the mythos back together. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm just going just gonna to throw this out here. Throw it away. Paolini, as, as far I'm as I'm going to keep good, saying Paolini, but please continue. But I'm going to keep saying Paolini, but please uh, continue. I, that's fine. I, I'm not sure which one's right. Well, perfect. As far as good authors are concerned, he is mediocre. In, uh, as, in, in the good, as far as good authors go. We ah. really like him as much as we do only because he was also homeschooled. <laughs> like, that's really the only reason why we like him so much. I'm going to give a counterpoint to that. I will say, I think he's above mediocre. And mm -hmm. the reason why but, I'll say that... That's why I said, of good authors. He's a mediocre okay. good author. Okay, yes. So, yes. no, but he's, he's above average. If you're, unless you're above average, people aren't really going to know about you. It's true. He's me. He's a mediocre good. Author. Okay, no, I'll give you that. that was, uh, when you word it that way, I'll give it to you. Um, he did something very, very special with things that people have already created. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but he, it was very, very special, and it was very good. And I think I have... Lord of the Rings and the Inheritance Cycle are now tied for me for books I've read the most, by the way. Like, all the mm -hmm. way to beginning to end. Uh, they're very, very good. And if you haven't read the Inheritance Cycle, go pick up a copy of Aragon right now and read it. Oof. So, we're not talking about book series, but individual books. What's the book you've read more than any other book? The Fellowship of the Ring. Book I've read more than Ooh, anything. Ooh, I take that back, I take that back. I've read The Hobbit more times than I've read The Fellowship of the Ring. The book I've read more than any other book is Romans. That isn't... <laughs> But yeah, probably... <laughs> you can read it 12 times in a day. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, pr probably probably the uh, either The Fellowship of the Ring or Romans. The reason why this doesn't count... <laughs> oh, no, I didn't mean to say Romans, I meant to say The Hobbit. I was thinking... So, <laughs> you said it again? I've said it! Um, <laughs> <laughs> or The Hobbit. <laughs> the Hobbit, because if I had to pick a single piece of literature that's my favorite <clears throat> book of all time, I'd go for The Hobbit. <clears throat> And not because it's necessarily better than anything else J.R. Tolkien's written or anything else anyone's written. You can read the whole thing in a weekend, really. Mm -hmm. if, if you're if you're dedicate time to reading, you can read The Hobbit in a weekend. It's a great way to introduce, even though it wasn't the first thing that was written, it's a great way to introduce <laughs> the world of, that J.R. Tolkien created. And it gives you the gist of a lot of things. And it does it in this way that's very whimsical and very light reading. Because it was a children's book. Yeah, it was. It, that was his book that was written for children. Which is the only reason that I will continue <clears throat> to defend Peter Jackson on The Hobbit. I think he did a great job making it whimsical and fantastic. Literally, the definition of fantastic. In yeah. a way that was childlike. And I think that made it amazing. Recap. <laughs> I don't know what that means, Kenal. <laughs> this is which language is that? Is that not from? I don't. I don't know. Oh, there we go. Do I plan a military coup? No, yes. I do not. Oh, uh, uh, I, I, not anytime soon. Well, not that we're gonna tell you about. <clears throat> mm -hmm. That would be cheating. Um. Tamp this. Tamp it. So, but back to the mythos thing. <clears throat> As a concept. The download helper has crashed. Good. Cool. I hate it. If you let's 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 actually quit trying to define it because we keep defining it. What, in your opinion, mm -hmm. who do you think genuinely has created the best mythos, the best realm for stories to exist in? It doesn't have to be just this author. Because remember, someone eventually is down the line. If you know who this is, good for you. Mm -hmm. Someone down the line had to invent elves, dwarves versus humans and created that sort of thing, which no one would mm -hmm. talk about that guy or girl or whoever it was, whatever donkey <coughs> wrote that. Okay, we won't do it without you. If we do a stage of military coup, I promise. You'll be we'll, the first to know. We'll tell you. <laughs> I promise. Um, but what, what do you think is the best realm for stories to exist in? The best realm for stories to exist in. Okay. And this is going to be obviously just be an opinion. Yeah. Okay, so that's a hard question because I can't say Middle Earth is the best realm for stories to exist in mm -hmm. because I don't think the same thing with with Middle Earth and and uh and Narnia or any of the worlds that CS Lewis has created just because if you say the best world for stories to exist in, I'm going to think anyone can plug a story into this world and it and it possibly makes sense. Yes. And I don't think anyone else could do that. Look at what Christopher Tolkien did. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so because <laughs> of that, yeah. Sorry, uh, and so because of that, I don't think I can say that about those. <clears throat> so the best world for stories to exist in, honestly, are the the various worlds that uh, 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 Gary Gygax and Chris Perkins created? Mm. They created the ultimate open world for storytelling. Okay. In my opinion, <clears throat> there okay there are and there are books about them even. Yeah. Uh, let's see, because let's see, uh, even freaking Bob Salvatore mm. wrote lots of books in those worlds. Um, uh, kicking. Um, uh, just don't add too many Ks, so there might be a problem. Yeah, you get above two and below four, so that's, yeah. that's a problem. It's a different thing. Five is right out. Five is right out. <laughs> so that's a, but that's a really, really good example of what we're trying to talk about, though, because it's not just talking about, we're not just talking about authors, essentially. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Even though they are, they're technically authors. I'm not going to say that they're not. Yeah. But 
they're, they're much more of a, they're kind of authors. They're much more they're cre- world builders. They, yeah, they're more creative genius than they are authors. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I'd write a book that was like I oh, yeah, I would I would totally read a book that Christopher Perkins mm-hmm. wrote. But and by the way, anyone <clears> who doesn't <throat> know, I'm that's fair. Uh, Gary Gygax and somebody else after who were the the creators of Dungeons and Dragons, mm-hmm. and then Chris Perkins is the modern head. Can I talk about politics? Uh, we can. Uh, we'd rather not. Let's not talk about politics. That can get yeah, sketchy in a hurry. Right, th- this is about um, uh, fantastic fiction. Is what is what this this current uh, uh, stream is about. But Chris Perkins is the current head of. We can let the candidates. Well, there's no one running for president in 2023. Um, uh, not in the United States. If you want to, if you want to run for president in 2023, whoever making is, yeah, you go. Yeah, go, go for I'll it. Support you. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, I'll vote for you in 2023. I don't know how the voting would proceed, but it would happen. I'm um, uh, for him. Uh, but they um. Uh, uh, Create an entire yeah. universe. <clears throat> Literally and, an entire universe. And Chris Perkins is the current. A creative lead, uh, I think specifically for Dungeons and Dragons, but maybe for Wizards like magic and stuff like that too. In at, at Wizards of the Coast, I don't know the answer to that. Mm-hmm. No kid needs political knowledge. We are officially on the realm of trolling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, uh, unfortunately, the only politics you're going to get today are possibly the politics as contained in the Fantastic Realms we're talking about, which can get very political. You're yeah. welcome. <clears throat> But we always feed the trolls. Yeah, but the only thing that we that we the the, we the, do. the, the only thing that's, that's I'll take some credit. <laughs> the only thing that is um uh, well not the only thing. The big thing that's interesting about the worlds they created isn't that they created the world and then established rules for that world to live by. Mm. They established rules. They said, my world will exist like this. Now let's build a world around that. Yeah, but, but that's the whole point of what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's the reason why that is really a really great example. So, <clears throat> I, I'm going to give you my favorite. And I think I didn't really know what I was going to say for sure until you said that sentence. And I think it's a really good outlier. So I'm going to jump back to H.P. Lovecraft then. Mm-hmm. First of all, I'm obsessed with H.P. Lovecraft. That's the reason why I have an H.P. Lovecraft tattoo. Read it constantly. Hewlett Packard Lovecraft. Lovecraft. Hewlett Packard Lovecraft. <laughs> he created H.P. Um, and by the way, guys, I know his name is Howard Phillips. I just so, it's H.P. It's Hewlett Packard. Um, <laughs> what he <laughs> don't inhale. Don't do that. Um, what he did was special because he wrote more letters and transcriptions and correspondences between the people, thousands of letters, way more than he ever wrote about books. And he obviously, wrote, what he did was special because it was, it's our world. Everything's taking place in our world or our universe. And he's saying, what if the rules of our universe aren't what we think they are? Mm-hmm. What if we're confused <clears throat> about them and the reason why we don't know is because we are so finite and everything else is actually so infinite? Which is terrifying and perfect. But the, what makes him special to me is so much of his mythos was actually pushed and, I don't want to say created, but the boundaries of it were pushed much further than he pushed them long after he died. Mm-hmm. So some of the best stories from the monsters, if you want to call them monsters, he created, actually were written by other people. And I'm drawing blanks right now on some other authors that were really good at that, and I wish I wasn't. But essentially, he started by saying, our world is not what we think it is. Of course, he wrote tons of stories that had nothing to do with anything, like magic stories about magicians living hundreds of years to take vengeance on one guy who killed one guy's kid. It's dumb. Mm-hmm. Like, what was that, the, the alchemist? It's really lame. But every single story that he wrote that's contained inside of our world by these rules is just really special. And the fact that he, he, he encouraged people to push that issue was really special. That hurt a lot. Please don't do it again. That's the reason why I'm going to say H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> so what you're saying is H.P. <laughs> Lovecraft was a passable author. He was a fantastic, specifically horror author and world builder. I'm going to give him above passable only because he's from the era of gentleman writers that I envy all the time. I mm-hmm. want to talk and live like every single person that wrote stories from that era. The, the gentleman scholar author sort of mm-hmm. thing. I, every day, am jealous that I could ever be that person. 
Mm-hmm. I love all of them. But he was the he was a really great example of that because he wrote with really great prose and he used the right kind of verbiage and he was really great for that. <clears throat> That's why I like him. I do myself talk like that sometimes, like how the but it's it's more of a not out of a I'm trying to do this thing. I am an inadvertent sesquipedalian. <laughs> okay. Otherwise I mean, known as an autist. Autist. He's autistic. Um, mm, no, nah, I don't draw that well. He's, he's really garbage. For the reason why I want to say he's above passable is because he still manages to make you very scared with what he's writing. He does a good job. Mm-hmm. And mm. if you ever want an example of how good he is at what he did really... And this isn't even his best story, and I would never recommend this as the first story you read from H.P. Lovecraft ever. But if you want an example of how good he is at making you go, holy cow, our world is a giant festival of monsters. Mm-hmm. Mountains of festival? Madness. I did. I messed up. Mountains of Madness. Mm-hmm. He literally takes the history of the world, stands it on its head, and shows why the history of the world is actually for all the elder beings and all these old ones and old gods and everything. <clears throat> And it's terrifying because he outlines it perfectly, describes it perfectly, makes you go, holy crap, this is actually what's happening. And then he gives you a little bit of taste of those monsters and then writes a whole bunch of other stories about those monsters. But the Mountains of Mass was essentially his way of saying, here's how it really all happened. Here's the history of these two things, this Mm -hmm. set of stuff. So what would you recommend as an introduction? As an introduction? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Mm-hmm. So if I want to say an introduction to H.P. Lovecraft, if you like, if you're okay with your first one being a little bit of reading, mm-hmm. I do really think <coughs> that it's worth grabbing a few things mm-hmm. that will give you the idea of his style. So obviously Call of Cthulhu is a layup, but it's really good. Mm-hmm. It's not terribly long, um, and it's not terribly engrossing like the Mountains of Madness is where it's mostly just reading over <coughs> scientific reports, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, if you read that... And then you read the color out of space. You get the idea of what he's doing. He's introducing <clears throat> insane concepts to the world we already exist in. What is that noise? Uh, it's either Roger downstairs or the ferret doing something. Hey, Roger. Um, but if you read, the, I think those two things are a good starting point. I also really like Dagon because Dagon's very short. But Dagon doesn't <clears throat> describe anything, it just shows you Dagon. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but that will give you the idea of what he's talking about. There are things that exist that we don't know anything about that have been here for way longer than we've been here. And they're all terrifying, and they're all trying to kill us, and they're all really good at it. But I mean, Call of Cthulhu is a great start for that. Dagon's mm-hmm. really good. Nyarlathotep, Nyarlathotep, however you want to mm-hmm. say it, doesn't really yeah. matter. I think I said Nyarlathotep more than I said Nyarlathotep, but either way... That's a really good one because he essentially is saying that <clears throat> Tesla, Genghis Khan, some of the old pharaohs, all these people were actually one entity that's deceiving mm-hmm. the world and um, uh, trying to turn us into whatever the elder gods are trying to turn us into. Which, when he was writing, Nikola Tesla was, as a man, extremely relevant. Yeah. And <clears throat> also, if, have you read Nyarlathotep, <clears throat> the story called Nyarlathotep? Mm-hmm. It's... They essentially, in that story, he doesn't say the name, mm-hmm. but he's saying he's Tesla in the story. <clears throat> my f- it's great. favorite thing, probably my single favorite thing about... Can I help you? Oh, there's a line. Like a oh, it's blue ink. Pen it's actually ink left over. This is from like a day ago, so mm-hmm. the transfer paper is still there. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but, um, uh, okay, so speaking of, of which, by the way... I don't recognize any of these symbols, but if I had to guess, these had something to do with Lovecraft. They are all, <coughs> while we're talking about it. Yeah. This is my Lovecraft <laughs> tattoo, actually. Because mm-hmm. I always wanted a really minimalistic one, so I found uh, an accepted bestiary for H.P. Lovecraft's monsters. There's a couple hundred of them. Mm-hmm. And there's Cthulhu, Nyarlathotep, Dagon, Shubnagorath, um, Yogg-Sothoth, and Ashtaroth. Uh, Tyler. Sean. We're on YouTube. It's Shub-Negro-Rath. Sorry, you two. <laughs> Work on my pronunciations. Um, uh, <laughs> but, ow, that hurt. Don't do that. Um, uh, they, um, uh, they do. 
the something happened. And now I know. What am I talking about? Oh yes. Um. Uh, dang it! I forgot again. Hold on. Give me a second. I got this. Oh. No, that only works when Dad does it. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. Um. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so we're talking about. <clears throat> oh yes. Ah. My favorite thing about HP Lovecraft is that his name was Howard. <clears throat> Is that name. whether or not he pulls the names directly, he, a lot of his names, so many of his names are influenced by old gods or old like, or old cultures or things like that. That way, that because the reason why I like that is because they're say, like you know, it's so much more real. Not like like Dagon, the old Philistine god. Yeah. Um, uh, Nilar Hotep. I don't know if that actually was anything, but that's an extremely Egyptian it name. Is. Yeah. And so, like, <laughs> and, and so it make it seem like people were people were, were were knowing about or worshiping these gods for thousands of years, and I yeah. love it. Yeah, it's really it's it's super immersive that way. So, like, that specifically, um, uh, again, either Narlathotep or Narlathotep, mm -hmm. um, either way, the the origin of him showing himself to man. Mm -hmm. He is technically a he, as far as these entities can be he. He tends to show himself as a man. Um, the first showing is in ancient Egyptian times. And so that name came from that time when he named himself as to people that would have thought, mm -hmm. oh, this is a normal name. So that's what he did, and it was very, very good. So I'm, I'm going to pull up something him. over here pull from my... Um, uh, uh, Your handy dandy... Oh, that's not in here, it's in... Notebook! This. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> They're remaking Moose Clues. No, no, it's not. It's in documents, I guess. Daisy as opposed to so, Daisy. So, I'm going to pull up something from the Monster Maker. Uh -huh. The D&D &D Monster Maker. <clears throat> um, uh, and then, just so everyone can see... Just so. Um, uh, I'm, I'm using this as a definition for what uh, Tyler just said. So he's talking about he's a he as much as someone can be a he. You'll notice... There's a check... No, our face is in the way. You notice right here, there's a checkbox at the gender that says, Unique. <laughs> that's what... <laughs> that's what these are. That's, Who they're knows? They're all unique. <laughs> there's no point in diving into, like, the different types of monsters and what they do. <clears throat> for HBO Lovecraft, mm -hmm. that's not what we're talking about today. But it is worth <clears throat> mentioning that the way, like you just said, the way... <clears throat> he chooses to introduce them, and how he chooses to introduce them, and how he chooses to put them into our world is what makes it... The terror comes from how believable it is. Mm -hmm. You can't disprove anything he says. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Not really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, granted, it's pulled out of his butt, <clears throat> but I mean, you can't go, wow, that actually makes a fair bit of sense. And he's like, prove me wrong. Yeah, you're right, I can't really prove you wrong. Mm -hmm. And he ties it in with world events and different things that happened, and it's pretty fantastic. And he even lets it sit inside of our world. Like, it even sets on the East Coast. Like, it's in Massachusetts, Rhode Island area. Like, he has... A lot of it exists there. Yeah. Oh, speaking of which, the the books I would recommend as the... Of course, you've read more Lovecraft than I have. But the books I'd recommend as the introduction to Lovecraft, just because I think they're very easy reading, and they don't get deep into... Neither of them get deep into the mythos that I... As far as I know, they both of them are extremely shallow in, in the mythos. But both of them give such this, really go into the cerebral aspects. The of, cosmic terror. Yeah, of, of what Lovecraft is. And so my, the first two books I would recommend, I think neither books, I think they're both short stories, but I think he wrote pretty much short stories. Mostly. Almost entirely. Uh, uh, is um, uh, The Shadow Over Innsmouth. Mm-hmm. And the other one that is almost exactly the same as Shadow Over In's Mouth, but never actually takes place on In's Mouth. I'm trying to think of like it's this it's the same thing. There's one guy and he's trying to find out about something. So he's so he travels here, talks to these people, and eventually slowly goes mad himself. <clears throat> Which I guess is the premise for a lot of his Yeah, for most the, of them. One actually. guy that tries to learn and goes mad. But I can't think of the name of it. Um it, we we listen to the audio book of it. Uh, last time we went down to Oklahoma. <clears throat> Let's, uh, well, let really quickly look at this because I'm 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 gonna. You go to the table of contents. See if I recognize the name of it. There's my hours from work from forever ago. Very nice. 
The tomb, Dagon, Reverend Samuel Johnson, swear and Polaris, beyond the uh, wall of sleep, yes. memory, old bugs, transition, world, dream, wide ship, dream, became a star, and not, not any of these. Mm hmm. Set follows from beyond. You're all off the top. You're all off the top. Fish in the house. The music of Eric Zahn is really good. I do read that. It's only seven pages long. These are all at least decent. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The hound, the lurking fear, the rest in the walls. The unhumble, the festival, the shunned house, the word of the key in the vault that descended. Cool air, the call of Cthulhu, Pickman's model, the silver key. It's not the horror at Red Hook, is it? Could be. Because that actually does happen. It takes place in some houses. This guy, like... Um, mm -hmm. essentially commits a sacrifice to himself and his wife that he marries so he can go into the Underrealm <laughs> and stop the end of the world from happening. Uh, no, that, there's a policeman. That, yeah, that, okay. okay, so I remembered a little bit more of it, and now I'll, I'll tell you a, a bit more thing. A whole lot of what this guy does is not so much physically doing it, but he has a whole lot of correspondence with the professors. Whisper in Darkness. Okay. <laughs> so, Whisper in Darkness is where there's a gentleman who is a scholar. He's talking to someone. He's a gentleman and a scholar. Gentleman and a scholar. He's talking to someone on the East Coast who sees this thing called the Maya or the Migo. The Migo. Mm -hmm. And they're little crawly um, spider type things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they eventually take this guy over and put his brain in a jar, and the guy comes back and discovers it and all that kind of stuff. Probably Whisper in Darkness. Uh, pretty brain popular. in a jar. Brain in a jar. Four years next week. Oh, crap. I got rid of the chat. Bye, chat. There it is. Uh, Another good one is Dreams of the Witch House. You might have actually read that one, but it's a little bit different. But it's still just chess from Kano, so... <clears throat> Kano! Keep running for president, buddy. In 2023. This, I'm going to translate what he said real fast. We're just going to go to... I feel like this could have very well been from... One of the books we were talking about, because he immediately started trolling when we didn't understand it. Um, this was an aggressive on trolling. Oh, well. Okay, so it says it's Turkish, which then like Kanal could be Turkish, but Google doesn't understand the Turkish. I don't think it's Turkish. Translation verified by Translate Community. That it means the same thing. Yeah. So it might be a name. I don't. I have no idea. Oh well, we'll figure it out. <coughs> well, so let's talk about. So we go into H.P. Lovecraft and let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Boda boda bear. Okay. I'm, let, what, let's talk about what makes another one really, really good that's completely different than H.P. Lovecraft. Because H.P. Lovecraft made his things real by making mm -hmm. them believable in our world and making us think while we're reading the book, this could happen to me next freaking week. Mm -hmm. That's what made him good. But it also made him terrifying. He was horror specifically. Still high fantasy mm -hmm. in low high, low fi low fantasy. High. Low high. Low fi fantasy. Low fi fantasy. <laughs> well, it was like the 30s. Um, <laughs> low high fantasy. But it was all inside of our world. What's what? Let's talk specifically about one that's completely outside of ours. That's in a novel. So you said D and D essentially, and I said H.P. Lovecraft. But mm -hmm. if we're taking, let's talk about the world. This 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 concept of a world that's been written about a million times with mm -hmm. all of these other magical beings and magic. Mm -hmm. Who's doing this best? And we already know the answer to this. But like, let's talk about why. Okay. Who did this best? I should say. <clears throat> Oh, we're talking about mine now? Is that what you said? Whoever's. Okay. I, I didn't know if you were talking... You know, I'm not going to say this. There's a one person who did actually did very good at making a consistent world and keep it, kept with their rules and stayed very good um, uh, with their high fantasy novel. Mm -hmm. And I was actually impressed with how not only how fairly well written it was how true it stayed to its own mythos and also how comical uh, this book was have you ever read The Hidden Evil written by Aaron Moberly <laughs> uh, <laughs> I saw that coming I you know it's been many a, it's been many a, a year since I've read it. I think I only read that in the draft stage actually uh -huh. if I remember correctly I say I proofread that that book. I did as well, and I will go ahead and give it a thumbs up. I'm not gonna lie. Go. I don't know where you would tell people to find that at. I don't think it's findable. Yeah, it's not findable. Um, uh, she only had one book published, and it wasn't that one. It was not that one. It, but I, I did purchase that book. I also that published, published that book. It's right here somewhere. I have it signed by the author. In fact. <clears throat> oh, I don't know if I did that. Oh, I didn't go to the book signing. <laughs> I I think I was I had enough influence <laughs> yeah. that uh, I had it signed after the book signing. You know, I was the primary consultant on that book. I've heard not, not on that one, not the one that was published on the Hidden Evil. I was the, I was the primary consultant on that book. <laughs> so, in case you're curious, our sister Erin wrote a was written several books actually. She's quite mm. good. 
Um, yeah. <clears throat> and I'm not saying because she's our sister, but she's quite good. She, uh, she is. No, actually, uh, we're mean enough to that sister that if we thought it sucked, we'd let her know, and we'd let you know. But no, it's <laughs> she's quite good. Um, mm-hmm. Written several. <clears throat> the Hidden Evil is one that, again, we're talking about mythos. Why the heck not? Uh-huh. Um, it's inside of a fantastic world, a fantasy world. Mm-hmm. And it does a really good job of not <clears throat> being totally focal on trying to describe the world that it's inside of. Mm-hmm. So which is the boundaries that we're giving this right now? Nothing was technically created as far as a mythos, but characters <clears throat> were created and a world was created. So in a way, a minor version of a mythos. Mm-hmm. Which, by the way, uh, the main character in that book, um, uh, going back to Chris Perkins, the main character in that book is named Talandrith who is named after the main character of my favorite trilogy uh, in the Dragonlance world. Okay. <clears throat> and by the way, um, I did get this I, I did this gets confirmed from Chris Perkins himself. <laughs> I asked him and he told me. Uh, he told me. Um, uh, the, the land of Kryn, uh, where, where Dragon's Lance takes place, mm-hmm. is an official D&D setting. Okay. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. The only Dragonlance... Because tri- they're all trilogies, aren't they? I mean, 90% no, of them are trilogies. A, a lot of them are, but So no, many are like, trilogies. There are a lot of single books. I've read one that was like eight books. I mean, there's there's hundreds of books set in, in the Dragonlance. I'm setting. proud of all of you, by the way. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And I wish that you all wouldn't have done what you <clears throat> did, because I feel like you all could have been gone further in your career if you didn't just write a Dragonlance mm-hmm. book. <clears throat> Just because it was you, you were just another people don't remember authors is the problem, mm-hmm. and you think Dragonlance, and no one remembers the name of Dragonlance book except for you, you autist. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see, my favorite <laughs> b- besides that trilogy, I can't remember who wrote that because I read that when I was like eleven. Mm-hmm. But besides that, my favorite Dragonlance authors, and I don't know, I think they wrote some other stuff, but um, uh, usually because of. Women writers tend to have a certain focal point and writing style that they do, and this not and here's proof that's not true 100 percent of the time. But just generally speaking, I don't like women authors. But these women should I scoot away from you when you <clears throat> say this next sentence? Th- these two wrote my second favorite Dragonlance series, mm-hmm. and it's Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. Okay, I think I've read something else that Tracy Hickman's done. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And they're, they're, they were good. Yeah. And they were the ones that had my favorite line um, uh, ever, which was, By the hundred tits of the great mother. <laughs> <laughs> which wasn't meant to be funny, I don't really think. <laughs> but it was. <clears throat> I don't remember which trilogy I, I read. I only read two <clears throat> Dragonlance trilogies. I They're so... <laughs> no offense, because there's so many Dragonlance books, so mm-hmm. many, and so many great writers inside of that, if you want to call it a cycle, it's a cycle, I guess. Mm-hmm. There are so many great authors in that, it's hard for me <clears throat> to kind of condense all of you into the statement, but mm-hmm. because you're all writing about kind of the same thing, inside of its own, it's its own mythos, <clears throat> you're all writing inside of it, all of them feel watered down to me because of that. Mm-hmm. Now All I, of them do. I, I'm going to say this, you said there's a lot of great authors in there. There are... There are also some turns. Mm, some, <laughs> there are some rough Dragonlance books. The mm. trilogy that I remember the most was it was it focused on a war between the humans and the <clears throat> goblins, mm-hmm. and it was essentially saved by one big brutish guy marrying the most petite goblin girl there was, which is still a brute. And there's a really raunchy sex scene in that book if I remember properly, which I was not expecting as a thirteen year old. Can I help you? I need to get to my. It's been a decade and a half since I've read that book. I would love to find it again just so I can tell people about it because you did a great job, sir, madam, or otherwise. This fellow... It's not in this bookshelf. Go! Um, uh, this. My second favorite author of all time. And it's some of you that have actually read any... Who freaking are they? Drew Carpetian? No, actually, um, uh, Drew Carpetian is very, very good. Yeah. But um, uh, he uh, limits himself, so his books are good, but they're not as good as they... Oh, here's Gilbert Morris. Oh, Gilbert Morris! There's another guy that makes that, that makes worlds and is very good at it. Well, yeah. you can find it. Brent Weeks, uh, Night Angel. Yeah, I have a copy of that at home. <clears throat> mm-hmm. It's Let's okay. See, I have... I don't know where... I have the entire trilogy, and he only wrote the first one as a graphic novel, and I have the graphic novel, too, but I can't freaking find it any anywhere. But either way, Brent Weeks, he does so good. Like, I would set 
um, uh, the the world that he has um, uh, the Night <laughs> Angel set in, I'd create a D and D setting in that. That's so good. Sure. Oh, speaking of oh, going back you. to going back to Lovecraft, I love Lovecraft. and D and D settings and such. Um, uh, our D and D campaign that we had that I was doing on, with some other guys just ended, and they um uh, like recently, uh, like two weeks ago. Oh, that's recently. <laughs> yeah. For D and D. Yeah. <clears throat> and they had a thing. What was it? What happened? Um, poop. The I thing that they had was something. Oh, yes. And uh, so the guy who is doing it, I think he's going to ruin it. He's not. Uh, <clears throat> well, okay. Not, not, not the main guy. Uh, my friend Jodiah. He's very good. But the other guy. Um, I've uh, digitally met him. Huh? I've digitally met him. You met him in person, Jediah. I don't remember. It's been so long. <clears throat> you don't remember, but you have. I'm sure. Um, uh, but the guy who is um, uh, really helping to create it, he's like supposedly the mastermind behind this next campaign. He's helping to create it. As near as I can tell, he's not created a setting before. And he's not creating the whole setting, which helps. But he has to create the system, and he's definitely not done that before. Mm. And so he's trying to find ways that people have already done it. I found ways that people have already done it. And I said, okay, here's how they do it. It's really stupid. Here's how you should do it instead. It's so much simpler and it's better. Mm. And his response was, uh, I, 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 like, he liked his way better and his way was terrible. <laughs> I'm, uh, and so I'm not sure how well this is going to work out. But I am at least going to try to take part in it and we'll see how it goes. Mm. Um... But it's probably going to be... It could very well be awful. And that is... He is making a... Um, uh, the, and it, it has the potential to be good. They're making a D&D campaign... Uh, with a few tweaks to the rules to match this. And it's going to be set in Yarnum. I like the idea of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I love the idea of that. Mm-hmm. There, this is so easy to screw up. <laughs> yeah. So, for the the, un, the uninitiated, Yarnum <coughs> is an area, a space, a city? It's a city, yeah. And the world of Yarnum. The not, world. It's not going to actually probably be in Yarnum, but it's going to be the, that world. So, essentially, this is Bloodborne, one mm -hmm. of the greatest video games ever made. It's mm -hmm. in my top five, I don't know where. Maybe number one, honestly. Mm -hmm. But it's in my top five. Um... And it's essentially a Lovecraftian inspired mm -hmm. um, the world game. created by Miyazaki Hidetaka, Miyazaki. who we talked about earlier. Because, <laughs> full circle, we have to turn off the stream now because we talked about him again. Um, it's, I would see how this would be very easy to mess up. Yeah, it's, it's extremely easy to mess up, and that's why I'm trying to help because I'm better than that he is at it. But <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want it. So, <clears throat> I've been very obsessed with, for many years now, <laughs> And I've, all, I've started doing this at least four or five times. I've mm -hmm. tried to get people to help me with it four or five times, and it's never really worked out. The people that I ask have been um, unreliable at best for assistance. Not you. Do you like my shirt? It's my favorite streamer. He's a great guy. <laughs> he's a really good guy. Mm -hmm. Gay as hell, but he's a good guy. <laughs> I mean, you know. What, can, what are you going to do? <laughs> I've always wanted to, my, obviously my thing, I'm not very much of an author, mm -hmm. um, but I am halfway decent at music, and I'm halfway decent at writing music. I can do that thing. I've always wanted to <clears throat> create an entire concept, mm -hmm. and by that I mean the mythos, to a degree, it's always going to be borrowed from high fantasy. Mm-hmm. Characters, realms. I want to write all the music for it, and I want to do all the other stuff for it. And I've had the music working on it for a very long time, mm -hmm. just because I keep. I don't want to finish it until um, I have someone who would help me with writing. Um, and I kept having. Well, the, the <coughs> author that we talked about earlier, our sister, kept nice. backing out of it a whole lot. Um, like kept like being very non-committal about it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Shocker. Um, and. I've always wanted to create that entire concept, entire realm, because for me, what I like about something 
or when you, especially in a, in a novel or, or in a story or in a world you're creating, what I've always really thought was important was to find other things that you can create along with it that makes it more immersive. So, for instance, there's a um, <coughs> if you were to have just a book, nothing but this book, there are no pictures, there are no illustrations, there are no nothing. That's fine. But how much more immersive would it be if you had... Uh, art to go with it and music to go with it and things to go with it, a community that you could discuss it with like online actively as it's being created. <clears throat> that I think would be the pinnacle of doing a mythos. That's the pinnacle <clears throat> of where it could be. Introducing all the different mediums together mm -hmm. to push it further. And that's been a lifelong obsession with mine that I've just never been able to work with with the right people, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But that I think would be the greatest thing to be <clears throat> able to have everything immersed. So if you think about J.R.R. Tolkien, for instance... He did some illustrations. He did a couple. Mm -hmm. But he didn't do like all the stuff that um, uh, Alan, Alan Lee. Lee did for him, essentially. I say for him. He did for <clears throat> he did the, the, all that artistry. He made that stuff. And then if you go towards the movies, you have more illustrations. And then you have music because Howard Shore is a god among men. Mm -hmm. And all this stuff is great. But he didn't create it. He didn't have people sitting around him going, as I'm writing this book... This is the way that we're supposed to be portraying emotion. So write the music this way. And mm -hmm. here's what these characters look like. So draw them this way. That's never happened <clears throat> on a grand scale. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be cool. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, by I the way. um uh, <clears throat> there are um uh, going back to the portrayal of the Lord of the Rings um uh, in uh. Go, yeah, go, going back to the portrayal of the Lord of the Rings, and you said you were defending how Peter Jackson did it because of certain things. I am f I like the whimsy of The Hobbit. It's very whimsical. I, I do like that. But the, I'll tell you the thing that I don't like about The Hobbit is it's made clear in the books that goblins and orcs are the same thing, and they, and they made them two strangely, horribly different creatures in The Hobbit. That's the one thing that I didn't like. I think I'm still okay with it because yeah. it needed to be. You needed to have the trip to Goblin Town mm -hmm. and the introduction of the ring, essentially, mm -hmm. be even more whimsical than normal. So that way, when you had this ridiculous escape, because yeah. in the book it's like, and they left! Well, you can't just say, and they left in a movie. You have to show how they left. They need to make an insane scene about well, it. So if the goblins were whimsical and weird and mm -hmm. goofy, you can make this ridiculous escape more believable from a writer perspective. Now, mm -hmm. when you walk back out, the orcs look bamf, and they look mm -hmm. like they could kill you. The mm -hmm. goblins look like they're going to kill you because there's a billion of them, and they look like they would be squeak toys otherwise. Yeah. Well, it's see, flawless. I love that. Well, see, I, I think that could easily be pulled off because... One thing that they didn't include in there is that um, uh, sunlight is, with the exception of the Urukai who were bred with half men, so they were able to do so. Sunlight was excruciatingly painful for orcs, and so they were they took off running. They were chased out of the mountain, but they left at daytime, so yeah. they could not follow them because <laughs> they couldn't handle it. And also, there's the scene where they actually find to rip when they go to Rivendell, where Gandalf is essentially tricking them to go to Rivendell in the movie. <clears throat> that entire mm -hmm. scene takes place in daylight, and they're being chased by orcs into Rivendell. Yeah, it's. An oversight that I'm willing to accept because he... <clears throat> there's something about changing a book into mm -hmm. a movie adaptation that you have to change character development. You have mm -hmm. to. And you have to change the way some of the story happens. Mm -hmm. And you have to change the progress and the pacing of a story. The pacing of a book is shockingly different from a movie. That's the reason why it's hard. It's mm -hmm. easy to do a shot-for-shot shot remake of a book, but the pacing does not work for movies. You're going to end up with a Sundance <laughs> film, and no one wants to watch it because Sundance films are terrible. Yeah. So that's the problem. Mm -hmm. You have to change the pacing. And they had to change... Essentially, they had to change <clears throat> um, Thorin's character. Mm -hmm. Intrinsically. What drives him, what makes him different, what his hatreds and fears are. And when you do that, you have to create this other world that demands that you do certain different things. So I was okay with it. <clears throat> I mean, I love the movie. I, I, I didn't like that they handled certain things the way they did, but I mean, I still, I loved it. It was a great, a gr it was the best, it was the, the most true Hobbit adaptation I've seen. Oh, yeah. Um, they, uh, unless you want to, like, be, like, the the cartoon and just 
Well, the, uh, how many different? <clears throat> what was the number of dwarves he ended up actually killing at the end of that? Oh, uh, s- uh, <clears throat> they, they killed, killed six. Seven. No, they killed. Yeah. No, they killed six. No, because remember, uh, how many were left with the original thirteen? Seven. Soon to be and only four six. six. Soon will be only six. You're right. So they I killed seven. Math. I did my math wrong. Remaining. But yes, there would have yeah. been thirteen. Mm. But um, uh, they um, because uh, <laughs> this is a girl. They're dwarves. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to draw them again. <laughs> but they. <laughs> uh, what we're talking about. Oh yes, they um uh, uh oh yeah, and the, the only other thing, the only really major thing I don't like about the adaptations was at the time of like when it happened, um uh, Arwen's introduction. I didn't like that it happened when it did, and I'll tell you the only reason why I don't like that, and that's because. There is now with without um uh, uh without Glorfindel being there, mm-hmm. and Grant, I can see why they didn't want to introduce Glorfindel because he doesn't really show up ever again, and so I can see why they didn't well, want to do that in the movie, like just to have a. <clears throat> he technically does, but not in the Hobbit. No, I'm, I'm talking about uh, I'm talking about Lord of the Rings. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, okay, sure. That's why I said the the Arwen. Let's say I don't think Arwen is ever in the Hobbit. I think yeah. she has like a cameo. Uh, in the extended version, which I'm watching, but yeah, in in the uh, in in the Lord of the Rings, I can see why they didn't put Glorfindel there and they made it be Arwen instead because he's pretty much just there and then he's in Rivendell and he doesn't do much else. Sure. And so I can see why they didn't want to bring in another actor just for that. But I don't know. They they, they could have done something like they could have put him in Lothlorien. They could have had him be the one to die instead of Haldir. Make that make it a much better conflict. So show. Because Aragorn wasn't really friends with Haldir, and they had to force a friendship in the movie. In so like twelve Haldir minutes, died. yeah. And so they could have introduced Glorfindel and have him, um, uh, like have him have gone to Lorien and then bring the troops from there, and that would have been that would have made more stories. And sense. have him go back to Helm's Deep like, because the elves never showed up to Helm's Deep. Just letting you guys know that didn't actually happen in the books. But do it that way. They could have introduced Glorfindel and could have done it that way. <laughs> that would have been cool. Um, and it would have, it would have been, uh, and then they could have done it that way. And the reason why I would have liked it if they would have done that is because by removing Glorfindel. Now they kind of showed somewhat the power of the elves by having Arwen do the the falls instead of Elrond and Gandalf, and Gandalf doing it. Yeah. Um, uh, not the falls. I'm talking the, the falls of Rauros. I meant the river Bruin. Yeah. Um, uh, and by doing that, but. The thing is, though, they were they had the ring race advancing on Arwen, and then that's when she when she did take him out. If they would have left Glorfindel in there, they would have showed one. In my opinion, the coolest scene from the book. It was even just glossed over in the book, but it was still the coolest scene ever. And that is Glorfindel. After Elrond started the water, Glorfindel chased the ring race into the water because they were afraid of him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Because that's the power of an elf lord, is the ring race were afraid of him. See, yeah, but the thing <laughs> about the movies, how... In a book... <clears throat> mm-hmm. <laughs> excuse me. You can establish a hierarchy of power <clears throat> mm-hmm. much differently than you can in a movie. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, you can read a book and figure out, oh, regular people, mm-hmm. a few people that are stronger than regular people, the ring race... Elves are probably right below them. An elf lord, uh, the Maiar, mm-hmm. and then you're going on and on and on and on. And you can stomach all that and digest it in a book. In a movie, that's hard to pull off. Well, see, so they showed two Maiars being equal, Gandalf and the Balrog. But then they then went down and showed a low, a lesser being, the Nazgul, as being stronger than a Maiar when he broke Gandalf's staff. Exactly. They have to like, change. They, they have they, to. They, they they change the rules in the movie. That's so. true, but that's the whole point. The whole <clears> point <throat> is you have to have the hierarchy of power be different because, <clears throat> excuse me, it adds tension in some way. So, for instance, mm-hmm. so for instance, you've got <clears throat> if you would have had Glorfindel take these people that we are running from, freaking out about they're mm-hmm. all gonna kill us. We barely got away from them, mm-hmm. and he's just like, yeah. <laughs> Like, then who, who are they for the rest of the film? We uh-huh. know for a fact there are five people that can just walk up and be like, meh! Like, why do we care about them anymore? So all the tension's gone from those characters. They have to keep using the Nazgul as, as beings of terror all the time. And why would we be scared to move? We, always, we just saw this guy kick their butts, like, aggressively. Like, why do we care about them ever again? Yeah. It ruins all the tension for that character. But then they show... 
Um, uh, uh, but th- 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 then they show the oldest elf, Galadriel, and so she would have she yeah, having the power of an elf lord, and then other Meyer just and then another so elf lord Elrond, mm-hmm. one Meyer Saruman, and then um, uh, <laughs> Meyer, not Meyer, and then Meyer. another elf lord. Uh, so two elf lords and one Maiar destroying the ring rates in the Hobbit, yeah. and then her just like kicking Sauron's butt. So like they acknowledge the power of the elf lords in the Hobbit, I, is, but then they think about it. But then we watch the Hobbit. You say, oh, they acknowledge the power of the elf lords here. So what were they doing later? <clears throat> and I'll only explain to you one reason why, and this is the reason why I love the Hobbit movie adaptation <laughs> so much. Here's the only reason why I'm okay with that. <clears throat> How many pages in the Hobbit? <clears throat> A uh, quick rough estimate doesn't have to be very close. Four hundred. How many pages are in the Fellowship of the Ring? A little less than four hundred. They took the same <clears throat> amount of time to dive into the Hobbit mm-hmm. as they did the trilogy of the <clears throat> Ring or the sextuplet of the Ring, whatever. Mm-hmm. However you do it. Yeah. They yeah. dove that deep into it that they had the ability <clears throat> to establish the pacing the way a book would, and that's why it's special. Mm-hmm. So you can't take the Fellowship of the Ring and make a four-hour movie about it. Mm-hmm. But you can, but you do. You have to make the sacrifices that you made already. Mm-hmm. In the Hobbit, they took the same length eh, and made twelve hours about it. Mm-hmm. You can dive into some crap if you do that, and that's the reason why I'm okay with it. Because mm-hmm. they came across. I mean, they literally came off more than a decade apart. Well, a decade apart, almost exactly a mm-hmm. decade away from the Lord of the Rings movies, like almost on the nose, actually. Pretty much. I can't, I can't think of the release dates. It was 2001, 2002, and 2003, I think, for the... For and the I want to say 2003 to 2013 is probably really close, if mm-hmm. we're being honest. Yeah. Uh, but either way, you. I think that they are allowed to make some of those things if you have that much time to explore it. Mm-hmm. But when you don't have that much time to explore it, you actually get a description of Glorfindel. You actually stop, Gandalf talks to Frodo, and you get to hear about Glorfindel. Mm-hmm. Briefly... But you do. You mm-hmm. can't have that conversation in a movie. Mm-hmm. Like people again, you turn into a Sundance film. Mm-hmm. That's all Sundance films are. They're just like books that just people are just writing all the way out to where you just drive the point into the mm-hmm. ground, and you have to pretend to like them because you're an intellectual. That's it. Mm-hmm. That's what these movies would be. You have to cut some of that fat off, and you have. But when you mm-hmm. cut that off, mm-hmm. you have to make some sacrifice. The, 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 here's the reason why Peter Jackson is so great to me. He did it in a way that's still believable, plausible, and I accept it. Look mm-hmm. at the way they butchered Aragon. Yeah. That's not acceptable. You jacked it up. You cut off the pieces that ended up being very important later, mm-hmm. and it literally ruined the rest of the movie series because of how badly you chopped the book up. <clears throat> Peter Jackson did it in a way that I still think is okay. Mm-hmm. Well, see, that, that's the thing with making the Aragon movie. Like, there's so many moments in that movie. Like, I think a lot of things were portrayed wrong. But there's so many moments in the movie that, like, if you read the book first, there was nothing that those, those, they could have been absolutely nothing, but just, uh, you read the books, F you. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And that's, that, that's, you you can't make, you can't make a movie that way. (laughs) They did, they made so many key mistakes. Like, Mm -hmm. he kills a Razzmik. Mm-hmm. In Both the first book, yeah. just, yeah. just demolish them. They're dead. They're mm-hmm. like the main mm-hmm. reason for reading the first 150 pages of Brissinger. Mm-hmm. Like three books in, it's now, the most granted, important thing. Granted, once once he you know gets his uh, gets his power, he becomes who he is supposed to be. He demolishes them with without sure. much trouble. But that's the point of like that was also the entire point at the end of Brissinger of introducing the new shade mm-hmm. was just so you could say hey like j- just to have that anime moment exactly <laughs> exactly so, hey remember that guy that we spent the entire book trying to beat last time and you almost died fighting him yeah you're just gonna rape him <laughs> <laughs> he's done so that is another thing I want I'll give. Christopher Pay we credit for because no mm. one else is doing this that we're talking about. Like Chris, I mean, Christopher Tolkien, no, obviously not him either. But J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, they don't do that. <clears throat> mm-hmm. They might have a moment, maybe, but there's this real hierarchy of the anime thing. So you, in anime, you have this. Here's a kid who's clearly special and strong. <clears throat> mm-hmm. He's introduced to a world <clears throat> where he's not. Mm-hmm. But once he gets there, it's revealed that he actually is, 
and he can take on those things. That power <laughs> attracts a power that beats him, and now we have a vicious cycle of, mm -hmm. am I stronger? Am I not stronger? I became stronger. I'm stronger again. This guy's stronger than me. I have to get stronger. And then they throw in elements from the beginning that was like a huge <clears throat> problem, mm -hmm. and you just destroy them. My favorite example of this <clears throat> is the worst thing in the world that happened to Bleach, the Bond Saga. Essentially, mm -hmm. the Bond Saga comes three quarter <clears throat> well, half the way through the series, and Ichigo essentially has to be taken out because he's so overpowered at this point, he could wreck the entire crew of bad guys from this 32 episodes. Mm -hmm. Wreck them. <clears throat> so you have to, like, botch the story just to make it work. That's when you screw it up. Mm-hmm. You have to, so he I, did that I, I, I don't really think I well. watched that that particular saga. What, is he going vacation or <laughs> he like he doesn't he's not there for half of it and then when he's there the that inner um uh, <clears throat> the um um Zabimaru thing that's mm -hmm. inside of him. Yeah. And he reads him and stops him. Like, not he reads him. That's the wrong word. He gets him drunk. <laughs> he stops him a couple times. So Ichigo stops fighting because he's afraid he's going to take over. So essentially, they just do this lame plot point to mm -hmm. keep him from demolishing these guys. Mm -hmm. So it's, if you do that with your story, you suck. Mm hmm. You're, 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 it's, if it's a weak <clears throat> plot point, avoid weak plot points. A weak plot point for this kind of stuff is essentially just saying, here's a convenient reason to not show character growth and a convenient reason for why we've skipped character growth in any way. You suck for it. Spend 20 more minutes, write 100 more pages, don't suck. That's terrible. I don't know if you noticed how much we like to blab. <laughs> it's, we, we, were I know. we were 20 minutes into this and I thought... We don't have enough material to make it to an hour. We've been going for an hour and 20 minutes. We <laughs> talked for an hour after that. <laughs> about <laughs> about not a lot of special stuff. Yeah. Well, of course, that's what that's that's the name of it. Aberfeldy 12, week 3, while we talk about something. Something. <laughs> <clears throat> well, again, I don't think I even gave my example of my mythos. I think you gave yours, and I think we started talking about nonsense for 45 minutes. The example of your favorite mythos? Yeah. No, 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 no. Or what? No, um, uh, after that, we. What, what, what was the point? <clears throat> this is a this is a podcast if we do this. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> no, what makes it what makes a mythos special? I think we dove into it a little bit, but I have a sentence about this because I've oh, been yeah. I said consistency, and that's that we ran we ran talked for really, an hour and a half about consistency. It was a good point. <laughs> it was a very good point. I'll give you that. Um, for me, and I think I've already said this, but I think we're going to make a point about it and probably talk too long about it again. Mm -hmm. For me, mm -hmm. what makes a mythos in particular special is if you can make the background noise of your story that you're writing, the background noise, the mythos, the concept of the universe you exist in, to carry on behind you mm -hmm. and no one's noticing it. You're accepting it like it's just happening and you're not giving it a second thought. So to reiterate what that would actually mean, mm -hmm. in Aragon, they come across history. <clears throat> you get to know about what's happening in the background with other races, what they're doing, how they're involved. And the way they're brought up, you just run with it and believe it like it's not a big deal. There are so many stories... That you have to go back and go through this tedious drag through the mud moments to bring you up to speed with what's happening. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And it kills your pacing. It kills the world you live in. It kills your mythos. It kills everything. Because you're just loading exposition. And ex that's the real, the real thing. Exposition. Proper or not proper exposition. What are we doing? I'm just typing stuff in. Oh, okay. But yeah, honestly, exposition. If you can't add exposition the right way, you suck. <clears throat> you just suck. It's not hard to do. It's really not. Just don't... Just don't suck. Mm -hmm. the, Christopher Paolini had moments where it was so close to being terrible, but they, he, he introduced it in just the right way that it made you hold on. So, for instance, he goes to... What's the place when he goes to the home of all the dwarves when he has the big problem with all the different tribes and the magic tribe, <clears throat> like, tries uh, to kill them? Um... It was uh, Farthen Door. Farthen Door. So Aragon goes to Farthen Door. Which, by the way, what came first? And was, um, uh, in the first uh, Dragon Age game, <laughs> which one of those came first and which one was based on the other? Because it's the oh exact same story, the exact same thing. It really is. It has to, they, they, couldn't have, they couldn't have been made independently. I genuinely think Aragon was... Well, no, 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 no. <clears throat> that was in Brissinger. Hmm? 
That means Dragon Age came first. He goes to Farth and Durin Brisinger. No, he goes to... He goes to Farth and... No, he goes to Farth and Durin the first one. Or the no. second one. Because... I'm not talking about Farth and Durin then. No, I'm talking about the home of the dwarves. <clears throat> yeah, Farth and Durin... Farth, Farth and Dur is the home of the dwarves, and it's where the um uh, the Vardens, uh, what you're thinking? Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, the Varden were stationed there for a while, but it's he also the goes home of the to the home of the dwarves for his friend's <clears throat> wedding. Oh, that's what I'm talking. about. The actual home of the dwarves, like the home base. Of yeah, the that's dwarves. In not Brissinger. the home of the Varden. <clears throat> that's so in that's in Brissinger. Because well, Farth and Dur is like it's the capital city of the dwarves. That's where and it's sure. also where the Varden were for a long time. Sure, sure. Mm-hmm. But I mean, where he goes to where the main area of the dwarves, where he sees a god for the first time. Mm. The reason why that's so special is because, hey, you show a god. There are gods. Is that in Brissinger or is that an inheritance? Yeah, it's not an inheritance. It's not an inheritance. No. Okay. Um, Aragorn sees a god, essentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, Aragorn learns about the history of the dwarves. Mm-hmm. And Aragorn learns more about this, the language of magic. And he does it all through <clears throat> reading tomes, having people describe stories to him, seeing pictures on the wall. In theory, that's boring as balls. Mm-hmm. But they managed to, to put it out and they paste it over the course of the whole book, giving you little nuggets at a time in a way that made it believable, made it easy to listen to, <clears throat> listen to easy to read. He managed to pull it off, <clears throat> but exposition mm-hmm. is very hard to pull off properly. If you're trying to rush it. Yeah, Which is why he quit rushing it, by the way. Brissinger was almost nothing but story. Yeah. And it was it was it wasn't my favorite book, but it was still it was very good. If I had to pick a favorite, it would not be Inheritance. Um uh, <laughs> if I had to pick a favorite, it would be um uh, <clears throat> it would be um uh, oh Probably Eldest. Eldest is a good pick because you get a lot of roar and story. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And it's nice to see... It's nice to see that you have other characters who aren't magically endowed superhumans doing mm-hmm. cool stuff. It's po- the politics. It's mm-hmm. the politics of the book. Um, that's what makes Game of Thrones so great, honestly. The politics of Game of Thrones is what makes Game of Thrones good. Yeah. Made, it's done, and ended terribly. But what's what made it good for the most part... Mm-hmm. That's what made it good. And Eldest was all about the politics of everything. The politics of the Varden for Aragon. The politics of how small <clears throat> government entities, um, innocuous communes, all mm-hmm. these sorts of things work in through these two different people. Because it's Aragon learning how to fight, learning how the Varden works, and um, Roran learning to lead and how learning a small group of people works. And it's very political <clears throat> in that vague sense. So you should have stayed on. We're talking about politics now. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Thanks, Canal. Um, K-Anal. K-Anal. Um, so no head. Um, <clears throat> it's what makes Eldest <clears throat> the most impressive of the <clears throat> books, mm-hmm. but not my favorite. Mm. So, I'm... Uh... Going back to inheritance, and the reason why I said it, I said it is not my favorite. There's something very particular about that. I'm uh, changing the rules. Um, uh, so he kind of changed the rules in order to defeat Galbatorix, but he changed the rules in a way that you knew was going to happen. It was led up to that, so you knew. So there was an okay changing of the rules when they discovered the name of the ancient language and were able to change how magic worked. Like that was like that. That made perfect I, I, sense. I don't want to stop you. I don't want to interrupt you. Mm-hmm. But I will say the reason why that's useful and good, and the reason why I'm okay with them doing the changing of the mm-hmm. rules, is yes. technically God of had the whole time. Yes. Yeah. That changing of the rules made made sense. That's not the changing yes. rules that I was upset with. Let's continue. After they changed the rules, now they had the ability to change the rules. And a person using the established rules said, "By the way, Aragon, you're going to do this thing. I've prophesied it." But now they have the ability to change the rules. And he said, oh yeah, you said I had to do this thing. I guess I gotta do it now. There's no way around it. Even though I am all powerful and have the ability to change the rules, I can't, I can't stop it. So this is what ruined <laughs> Star Wars. Let's just be honest. Let's be realize about what really ruined Star Wars. Episode 3 really ruined Star Wars. And I know, we both love this movie. Mm-hmm. We both really love it. But Star Wars 3 mm-hmm. was essentially, okay, everyone has to be in places for Star Wars Episode 4. How do we get them there? Mm-hmm. Go. That's all that it was. No, what really ruined Star Wars was Episode Eight. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what really ruined. That's Star what Wars. Ru- Hold on, that's what ruined the good series of Star Wars. Uh-huh. The ones that we talk about and don't uh-huh. hate. Episode three ruined Star Wars mm-hmm. because 
you of what you just said. Mm-hmm. In the first book, Angela prophesies over Aragon and says, "This is what's going to happen." Mm-hmm. And it became he became his own self fulfilling prophecy. Mm-hmm. I hate that. <clears throat> mm-hmm. It's like, well, we said it has to happen, so it's going to happen. What would have been cooler? With him just saying, Yoda's well, in the house. Do it. Hey, Rory, how's it going? Rory. No, I Yoda hate doing is- this to you, man. You're all, you always show up like two minutes before we have to get off. <laughs> I love that you bring up Yoda right as we finish talking about Star Wars. It's perfect timing. <clears throat> And I know you're 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 in you're in Central Time, aren't you? So I mean, it's even earlier for you. But yeah, it's, I wish we could do it at a better time. It's just this is the only time that works out for us. It's true. <clears throat> but yeah. But like, as I said before, like, he's the you know, he's the the manager for a Fortune 500 company, That's, and <laughs> you make it sound like it's that important. Yeah, <clears throat> and. It's, it's it's hard to work around his schedule. It's, it's it, he just wants to say that I suck, and it's very true. Yeah, it, it, yes. it, he does suck. <clears throat> but that was the last part of that point was really just <clears throat> if you have the ability <clears throat> to do whatever you want, to write whatever you want, to make the story however <clears throat> you want. Why would you put yourself in a box? Star Wars three put itself in a box. Mm-hmm. Inheritance put itself in a box. They just left it there. Yeah, I think it's what like 167 on the so, 500. So, so it's not quite as as <laughs> important as he's making it sound. So, I am a market manager for Sherwin Williams, which is a Fortune 200 company technically. Mm-hmm. So te- I'm very low on the totem pole as far as middle management goes, but <laughs> technically, it sounds better on paper when you say it the way he said it. <clears throat> I mean, that's, I thought it was like, you're, you're, you're pretty much the, the GM of a retail location for a... Well, Fortune 200 is better than Fortune 500. So. I always do whatever I want whenever I want. Rory, same. <clears throat> Rory, go write us a book, please, because you're going to do it better than apparently Paolini did. Yeah. We ruined the ending we're, of that we're, book. We're, 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 we're complaining about... Um, uh, we start off talking about what makes a good book, and then we start off, and then we went on to how Paolini made good books, and then we were complaining about how he ruined his books in the end. So by doing inheritance, essentially. Mm-hmm. You missed us talking about all of our, our authors and mythoses and all that kind of good stuff. So coming in now probably seems awful weird. Yeah. But sorry, I, I know you know you're an hour behind us, and we start early anyway. So I mean, we start. We start at 6 o'clock your time, so that's pretty bad. <laughs> and I wake up at 6 o'clock my time, so I know how much that sucks. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> we've hit our 90-minute mark a few minutes past, <clears throat> actually. No, right on the nose. Uh, yeah, 132. Um, and as always, well, not as always, we didn't do this last time. As I don't usual. think we did last time. As most of the time. We're going to add. We're going to throw in some stuff here. Let's so do some music. Like, okay, so I am playing this song. I chose this song today. This song, like this band, was one of my favorite bands, and they kind of dropped off on quality a little bit. They came out with a new album last year, I think. Mm, two years ago. Two years ago, and uh, it was so good. And this is my favorite song off that album. Actually, when I first heard this, it was a single. It was before the album released. And it's oh, it's good. This breaking thing. They stop you good for a time. I can feel the animal with They stop being good for a time, and now they're so good again. Okay, so peaking there, uh, it, no matter what level you have this at, it's going to show it's peaking because it's peaking on the way in. Uh, I'm going to see Breaking Benjamin in about 20 days. Excellent. And with Chevelle and um, uh, uh, Three Days Grace. Mm-hmm. Oh, a great show. by the way, in 2017, I showed you a year. band. Yes. Yeah. I showed you a band in 2017. I said, I really like this band. And you said, they sound good, 
but you given their sound, um, uh, like they sound good, but you would have really liked them if they had made it five years ago. That was so. It, so that would have been two thousand twelve. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, you said if, so if they if they had made this sound five years ago, you would have liked them so much. The album was released in two thousand eleven. <laughs> Um, Do you like them better now? <laughs> no, because I've met them all and I don't like them. Okay. <laughs> they had, they're really lame. I don't think... I thought we listened to it way before 2017. Wait a minute. Hold on. Released, released 2013. 2013. The album is 2011. They were, that means they produced it in that time frame. It wasn't released until then. Okay. So, <clears throat> yeah, so we're talking about a band called We Is Human. Mm-hmm. Um, I've played a couple of shows with them. They're decent people. They're just weird live. Mm-hmm. Um, Most bands are weird life. That's true. <coughs> um, they're in that kind of <coughs> alternative or hard rock metal. Uh, uh, unfortunately, specifically they... alternative Christian hard rock. Yeah. <laughs> so essentially, they're just doing a sound that a billion other bands have already done for years, mm-hmm. and because of that, no one cares about them. Well, I mean, it doesn't make it sound any less because everyone does it. I'm not a hipster. <laughs> That's true. But what I'm saying is, it would be so much cooler to me if it was. Like, <coughs> I would have been like, what? Oh, if they were the first person I heard do it. And mm-hmm. since they were the 12th person, I was like, oh, I'm going to buy that. Mm-hmm. But that was it. Well, see, for me, like, I wasn't, I, I'm rarely wowed. The last time I was wowed by music was when I heard um, uh, War by um, uh, 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 Dragon Force. Mm-hmm. And it was just because, wow, this is Dragon Force? <laughs> <I'm> like, wow. <laughs> and, uh, like, you guys are so manly now. <laughs> um, uh, but it's, um, uh, Oh, you'll like this. I'm gonna. I'm not adding it to the playlist. But I'm gonna play this song for you. Uh, Take the bullets away, featuring Lacey Stern. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she has her own solo. Turn this up a little bit. It's a quiet song. Check this out. Try to find religion. Like to see I what think. I've become. I was ruined by the world, but I blamed it on the sun. Am I worthless? Am I filthy? Am I too far gone for the remedy? Will you help me? That's that exists. Are you talking about Dragon's Milk beer? And there's a cigar like. Talking about the stout, I'm assuming the Holland Brewery stout. Yeah. No, I don't. I'm not a fan of of. A bourbon barrel aged beers. Um, that uh, one's good. And this, that one, I, I'm, I, and that's why I'm not a fan, a huge fan of Dragon's Milk because it still has that that sour taste from the bourbon barrels. Mm. But it is, if that's, I'd try a cigar of it, mm. but definitely. I feel like you also would have to make it. I thought that he was just like hmm? Dragon's Milk. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all you need to say. That's a sentence in and of what itself. What else do you need to say? <laughs> Dragon's Milk Cigar. It's like saying Buffalo eight times. Actually, Ryan, I don't know if you, 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 you weren't here early enough to see it, but we actually did pipes today. Mm-hmm. We normally do cigars if we can, but today was pipe day. <clears throat> and you, you'll be happy to know that what we smoked uh, was my own blend. I'm and not... it was fantastic. I will, I didn't comment on it. We should have commented on how good it was. It was really good. Mm-hmm. We got so engrossed in our topic for once, it did that. <clears throat> yeah. I'll shoot you the influence card. Please I, do. I appreciate it. Um, we will uh... purchase some. <clears throat> yeah. Does YouTube still support private messaging? Did they ever? They used to at one point. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, pipes. <clears throat> yes, sir. Yeah, we're a huge fan of McQueen pipes. They're They're... My favorite brand of pipes because they're they're not expensive and they smoke good and they look so darn cool. They do look great. They look really <clears throat> great. For being simple, they're great. I kind of want to get a really cool looking meerschaum pipe. I don't know if you've ever seen, seen them, but they're they're it's it's a natural resource meerschaum. No, no what? Oh no no YouTube doesn't support instant private uh, messaging anymore. Okay then. Uh, I trust I trust your judgment on what YouTube does doesn't allow from all the videos you released actually so yeah from I all you. from all the videos you've released and all the trouble that we've had with with let's say PMs so gone. that is unfortunate I love PMs not being gone <clears throat> yeah I guess the only um uh, uh, I I guess the only uh, contact in way uh, there's uh, oh copyright audio in your stream your stream may be temporarily blocked no we'll it's play not music nah, shut up <clears throat> then uh, I guess. I don't, I don't know. You could email us. <laughs> please do. That's, By the yeah, way, that please would work. do. 
Yeah. Because I would love to have this. We love yeah. trying new cigars. That's our shtick. So, mm. by all means. We love trying new things in general. <laughs> <laughs> trying new sticks is our shtick. Yeah, uh, that, that, that would be awesome. I think... Let me check to see if the email... If, if the email address is we'll on, the, into the, on the page. Um, I'll put it in the chat if it... Let's see. Yeah, it's, it's not on there. I'll pop it into the chat. <clears throat> it is... It's a very original email address. <laughs> yeah, please do, if you don't mind, <clears throat> sir. Oh, I'll, I'll, yeah, well... Even better. Yeah, we'll take this. Copy. Yeah. Fire one out real quick. Yeah, let's do it. While let's, we're right uh, here, because I want to, I, I would love to know about these cigars, I'll be honest. Um, so we do tend to like darker, um, smoking, the cigars that smoke much darker, the much more a robust sort of blend, we do kind of gravitate that way. So that would be great. I have a strong feeling that a, that the Dragon's Milk cigar would be a pretty dark cigar, which is exciting to me. Pop that through there real quick. Get this show on the road. <clears throat> yeah, I'll send a, an email out to you so you can have and our email also address. And emails. <laughs> All right. Just hit the send button. Hit it. You do not have to address it. <clears throat> Roy, we sent one your way. We mm -hmm. appreciate you. We'd love to get this info, and we'd love to try them. And we will try them, because we're those guys. We're just crazy like that. We're that boy. Oh, I, I didn't see it. I haven't, I haven't been no. doing much on YouTube at all lately. Let's, let's pull it up now. I would we're, love we're... to see that, actually. Oh, right there. Shoutouts to my sub two channels with update. I'll Is... assume it's that one. Turn up. Oh, my subscribe to yep. channels. What a guy. I thought today You're just would be awesome. a Super wonderful whiskey opportunity bros. to we appreciate you, man. acknowledge you. and recognize. I'll watch this in, in its entirety afterwards, um, uh, after this, because... Um, uh, it would be kind of weird to just have audio playing while we're talking and stuff. But yeah, we will. I, I 100%. I'm going to be getting on here and and checking this video out. You drop a, his but link I am going to go ahead and this one click too. like on it though. What? So you go ahead and get a link to his in the description as well. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. 100%. To the page. Yes. 100%. Go here. Oh no. Yeah, <clears throat> that's going to go into the video description. <clears throat> okay. We appreciate that, man. We appreciate you. But we've been ram. This is our longest video yet, an hour forty-two. Uh, we've been rambling for forever. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you, you know, I think everyone does. I think we'll everyone see, hates the sound of their voice. That's the thing. Not not only do I hate the sound of my voice on recording, but the thing we're doing, our voices are being fed straight back to us. So I have to hear the sound of my voice on recording the entire time I'm talking for this. It gets it, it gets really annoying really fast. <laughs> Definitely. Mm. <clears throat> Alright, well, we're going to have to cut this off because mm. it's time for me to go home and get make some breakfast for Chidrens. Because mm -hmm. that is my next step of the day. <clears throat> I think I might do the same thing for me, though. Not for Chidrens, for me. <clears throat> for me and me alone. But, Thank you so much. Butterface? You say I'm a butterface? That's rough, my guy. <laughs> it's not nice. Butterfaces is just... It's a derogatory term. I mean, my face, I, I just have a... You know, I have a, a nice fat face. I could I could probably... I could probably deep fry my face and it would taste pretty good. Oh, that would be delicious. Yeah. I'd eat your face. I would 100% eat your face. <laughs> well, Roy, thank you for joining us. We appreciate all the comments. Please send us that email. We'd love to get some hold of some of those. Um, for everything else, it's about time to get the heck out of here. Yeah, and once again, we greatly appreciate the shout out. Yes, sir. Yes. We appreciate you. You the man. Have fun, everyone else. Bye. See you guys.